This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, it was, uh, I think, three years ago, August, August or September, maybe September, I had the lovely Terry McMinn on the show from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Well, folks, that film is celebrating its 45th anniversary this year. And I would have been two years old when that was released in 1974. And uh, I have one of the Sawyer family on the phone with me today. Yes, one of the guilty parties. I have Grandpa himself. Uh, Please welcome the wonderfully awesome John Dugan. How do you do, John? Hey, how are you? (laughs) You're you're not sitting there with a little mallet in your hand, are you? No, 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 no. <laughs> no, just a bottle of water and a, in one hand and a phone in the other. There you go. <laughs> I got to tell you, they did quite a makeup job on you in that movie, I, I got to say. Uh, how long did that take in the makeup chair? Uh, the first time, I was in makeup twice for that film. Mm-hmm. The first time, it... Um, took almost seven hours, I think. Oh, gee. And then the second time, uh, which was a few days later, um, they got it down about four and a half or five because they knew more of what they were doing. Oh, wow. You know, but it was a lot of time. Because then you have to go to work for like 20 hours. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know? Yep. Well, that film celebrating its 45th anniversary. Um, what do you think of that, you know, of all these years? It's mind-boggling to me, really. <laughs> Not that uh, it's just it's still so popular, you know, and the mm-hmm. people um, that I am. You know, I made almost no money actually making that film mm-hmm. 40 years ago, but I've made a good amount of money over the years, over the last 45 years, um, uh, doing personal appearances and and um, and uh, signing the autographs, just selling autograph photos and things like that. You know, so you know, if I had, if I'd been given that much money uh, <laughs> in one check when I was 20 years old, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you today. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd have been dead. In the- a year or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we talk more Texas Chainsaw, I, I just want to get a little bit of your background. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the business. Boy, let's see. I'm from a small town in Indiana, mm-hmm. uh, United States. Um, and uh, I first got into acting in, uh, in high school. Um and uh, oddly enough, the reason that I showed up to the audition is because the uh, it was a period play, and the uh, this was 1959 maybe, and um, there was a big fight at school over dress codes, and uh, the length of your hair was a big issue back then, and um, the uh, the director and you know theater teacher a drama teacher had put out the word that um, any guy who got in this uh, play uh, wouldn't have to cut their hair for like six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> so she had the, the most young men turn up for any audition ever uh, for a play in, in that uh, theater club. And uh, cause they used to, sometimes they'd have a, uh, you know, women playing men's roles because they just couldn't get enough guys to want to uh, be in the place. Okay. So I just fell in love with it. I got the lead role and, uh, you know, my first audition. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, and then uh, uh, I just kept on uh, with, the, you know, with the theater club in school. And I did every play that was, uh, you know, from there on out the rest of my high school career. And then, as uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do, and uh, my girlfriend was going to theater school, not theater school, to art school, 
in uh, Chicago. And she had all these uh, catalogs from art schools. I was looking through one of them, and in the back of one, there was one page about their theater school at the Art Institute of Chicago. And uh, I didn't know such a thing existed. You know, professional theater school. Mm-hmm. So I started, uh, you know, checking her out. So I I sent in a uh, application and got an appointment for an audition. And I went to Chicago and I auditioned for theater school and I was cast. I, I, I was cast. I was uh, accepted. So I was accepted there, and uh, I was accepted for an audition at. Um, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York. Mm-hmm. But I had already been accepted uh, at the Goodman, so I didn't even audition for I, I didn't take the opportunity to audition for the AADA. Um, because, of course, my girlfriend was going to school in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so if things were different, who knows? Maybe I would audition for that school in New York and end up in New York. But so I went to theater school in Chicago and then ended up doing theater in Chicago. And then, uh, you know, I'd done a couple of industrial films in Chicago. Um, and uh, I was doing a summer play, a children's play at the Women's Theater, and Kim Hinkle, who I who happened to be married to my sister. Mm-hmm who wrote the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and produced it, he called me and asked me if I'd uh, come to uh, come to Texas and be in this film. So I quit the play and uh, went to Texas. And that was in the summer of 1973. Did you think you were going to play a grandpa? <laughs> I knew what I was going to play, and I got a script for him. Um, I also, I played two roles. I played a teenager in the scene at the cemetery in the beginning. Oh, okay. And if you look really close, I got mostly cut out. I had like two or three lines. And uh, so I played uh, Teenage Cowboy number one, if you look on the credits. <laughs> okay. And if you look really closely, you can see the back of my head and my shoulder. I'm wearing a cowboy hat and a white speeder t shirt, blue jeans. <laughs> okay. So the next time you watch it, keep your eyes peeled. Don't blink or you'll miss it. I got it home on Blu-ray, so yeah, I'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, yeah. You you were talking about the makeup process, you know, and uh, and I mean uh, that scene where you're wheeled out there. Uh, talk about preparing to play, Grandpa, because uh, um, it it was unique because you're in the wheelchair. Your function, you, it's almost like. Uh, it's a it's, rocking chair, no? Oh yeah, it's, it's right. Oh, well, that's right. And it's almost like I like when I first saw the film, I thought you were a corpse, but I guess you were. I I guess mean, everybody you... did. You know what? I and mean, I didn't realize that mm-hmm. until fans started coming up and talking to me and saying, "I thought you were dead." Yeah. And it never dawned on me was that what their intention was that have people think I was dead until I actually came to life. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It just never crossed my mind. You know. And I seen the film, and I didn't think I was dead because I knew I was in there, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, you got to work with Toby Hooper, of course. We fortunately lost him uh, not too long uh-huh. ago, but Toby Hooper, of course, has gone to make Poltergeist and The Fun House and movies like that, and uh, of course, very famous for Texas Chainsaw and cemented his name in uh, horror literature, so to speak. And what what was it like working with him as a director? Toby, uh, <clears throat> Toby didn't say a lot to me, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it seemed to me that Kim seemed to be the guy who was directing the actors, as far as because um, he was constantly rewriting their lines and everything. You know, mm-hmm. he was there all the time with a legal pad and a pencil. You know, mm-hmm. saying, "Turn the page out," saying, "Try this, try that." And uh, to the actress who actually had lines, you know. And and Toby seemed more hunkered down with the camera crew, you know. He directed the look uh, of the film. That's how I see their um, 
their jobs, how you know how they broke it down with the two of them co co producing, co directing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so he didn't say a lot to me about what to do. Except in the heat of the shoot, you know, I should always do that again and then try this, you know, that sort of thing. But um when it came to building character for me, it was Kim Hankel all the way. He he, he sat down and talked to me and just, you know, told me what he wanted. And he wanted, you know, what he had pictured as an embryonic old man. Someone who's gotten so old that they become, they've almost gotten back into the womb again, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and about the finger-sucking scene, um, he asked if I'd ever seen a, uh, a, a child a nurse before. Okay. Uh, and I had. You know, I had an older sister who had children, mm-hmm. and um, and he said, "You know this thing? I think they do when they they they, they finally the milk starts coming, and they they get a little excited, and they start they start kneading on the breast, and they and their knees will come up, and their whole body sort of gets into it." And I said, "Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about." He goes, "Can you do that for me?" I said, "You sure can." You know, and other than that, it was just do not move. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when she runs up to you. You know, in your chair, don't move. And when they're carrying you down the stairs, don't move. Mm-hmm. You know, and really until um, until you get the finger in your mouth, don't move. So. Yeah, Marilyn Burns. Yeah, Marilyn Burns. We unfortunately lost not long ago too. And I I uh, liked her in the film Jeepers. What a what a intense performance. You know, I mean, she just goes she right at it. Yeah, I I really liked her in the film and and um, this finger sucking scene. Um, I'm not sure. I read some. Pl- they they didn't use real blood for that, did they not? No, but she did. <laughs> in the process of the whole thing, well, they did. Okay. Um, I heard mixed stories about that. that's why I asked. Well, what happened? From what I understand, the um, gadget, you know, there's a bulb and a plastic tube on the off-camera side of that knife that ran down the back side of that knife. Oh, okay. The bulb had stage blood in it, and the tube then went down to the end of to the blade of the knife so he could make it look like he was cutting her. Okay. And squeeze the tube, but it wouldn't work. It kept getting clogged up and stuff. And we had to do it several times. And so, um, out of frustration, I'm going to just, <laughs> the, the bottom of the, um, the edge of the knife was taped so she couldn't get cut. He just turned his back and pulled the tape off of it and cut her finger. Oh. Yeah. And jammed it in my mouth, so. But I didn't find out until years later. Yeah, well... And I, I had dental, I had like dental things on my mouth and everything, so. Like gums, <laughs> plastic gums. <laughs> oh, I, I heard, uh, like, like she was a, I'll tell you, Marilyn was a real trooper, I mean. like. Oh my God, she was. Well, I, I, I heard they, they just used a dirty rag to gag her with, and I'm like. <laughs> oh yeah, it was just, it happened to be laying on the floor of that fucking, at the, at the garage, a greasy fucking rag. Yeah. Yeah, you know, somebody just put here. Use this. Oh my goodness! An old piece of rope, you know. <laughs> oh my! T- <laughs> but yeah, what uh, that that scene around the table quite intense, and I like the close up of her eyes where she's just going nuts, you know. And yeah, that 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 that, uh, that was done later. That was a pickup shot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and it sure works. Those green eyes, man. And she zooms all the way in. Yeah, I love that. But yeah, the whole the the um the scene in the the barbecue joint. You know, he went through a whole real real film on that. He just kept going. He had fun. And he just was watching. Yeah, he was just watching her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, the part where she um looks up. And notices all the arms and legs and stuff hanging in the smoker. Yep. And she's going back to her and then up and back. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, she was treated so badly. My God, she went through hell. But we were all treated pretty badly, really. 
If we're a union job, they would have never been able to get away with it, ever, ever. No. You know. Did you associate with Marilyn uh, Offshoot? Not then. No. But later in life, I did, yeah. Yeah? What was she like, I, you know? Because unfortunately. Oh, she was terrific. The yeah. sweetest, most loving individual you'd ever want to meet. Do anything to help you. Mm hmm. Um, just a sweetheart. She and I used to, um, when we first started doing appearances together, mm -hmm. like, well, 35 years ago, I guess, um, whoever was booking it would always try to schedule. If we were going to California, which we had to do a couple times, they would get us on, they would get, they would route me through Houston. Okay. And uh, get her on the same flight as me, so we'd be on the same flight together, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that uh, she made it there. No, nope. uh, no more. No, nope. she, she nope. ran into a little. She had a little few years. She had an issue. Yeah, no more finger sucking after the film. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I think I tried one time after an appearance in high school. She was going to ask me into her room. I walked her to her hotel room. I asked her if she was going to invite me, and she goes, no. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so much for that idea. <laughs> well, she no, wasn't. Don't do this, Sean. We're... She was, said, like, don't do this, Sean. We're friends. I was like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, she is a. Uh, she was a lovely person, and uh, I, I... That she she went too soon and uh, it was sad, but but a real trooper in that film. And of course, I've interviewed Terry McMinn, who was famous for that meat hook scene. I know you didn't have scenes with her, but I know you've interacted with her at conventions and whatnot. Well, I was there when they filmed that. Oh, di oh okay. Talk about that. Oh yeah, I worked as a, I worked as a you know, production assistant. I was there all the time. Oh okay. Well, talk about Terry. I had great experience interviewing her. I like her. Uh, she was uh, when I uh, knew her on set. She was rather aloof um, because the scenes that they were shooting, um, I had not made an appearance in makeup or a costume yet, mm -hmm. and so I wasn't one of the team who was an actor, really. You know, so. <laughs> Except for Paul Partain, nobody really talked to me all that much, I don't think. Um, it, you know, Paul, right away, he was the first person I met on set. Mm -hmm. But um, So I didn't really uh, know Terry until we started um, uh, doing personal appearances together. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know her well. I, I ran into her in L.A. a couple times, once I recall. You know, we talked a while. And we talked about getting together for a drink, but never did, you know, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. We were both living in Hollywood. Hollywood mm -hmm. Excuse me. Well, Paul, unfortunately, is also gone. And uh, and he, of course, was the wheelchair-bound Franklin. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was wonderful. He was wonderful in that film. Everybody was. Yes. Very, but very. He intense. always does it for me. He brings a smile to my face every time I see that film. <laughs> Especially when he's downstairs making those noises, you know. Uh -huh. I was uh, that was my first day there. <laughs> that was one of the first scenes I watched with him, with him rolling through there and doing the raspberry up at the ceiling and then rolling through and smashing his hand in the door jam. You know? <laughs> Which that was his idea. He added that in, ran into the door, you know, <laughs> just to add insult to injury. Smashes his hand in the door. <laughs> <laughs> But the floor, the floor was falling apart too. Oh! So he was on that wheelchair across that floor, and then he kept, it, it was falling through. <laughs> you know, the slats were breaking. It was really something. <laughs> yeah. And him, that whine of his, you know, come on, Franklin, go be a food chip. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> if I work any more for the day, I don't think I'll be able to take it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Oh, I saw a, print, a 35 millimeter print of it about 12 years ago in uh, in uh, Grapevine, Texas, mm -hmm. with a sold out crowd. And I introduced the film, and then sat down and watched the film with an audience mm -hmm. for the first time in years and years and years. 
And it was a five sample thirty five millimeter print that was missing the beginning. Uh it was missing the scroll with uh, John Larroquette voiceover. Yeah. Uh and one of the reels had Spanish subtitles on it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh sound quality wasn't all that great. But when that van door opens and uh and Bill puts the ramp out and Franklin wheels himself into frame. He got an ovation. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, cut tears to my eyes. Yeah. You know, because he certainly deserved it. Oh, yeah. That's he did in our role. Yeah. But uh, you were among a family of uh, killers in that movie. And i got to say, again, we lost Gunnar Hansen and... I heard so many nice things about him. Of course, he played Leatherface, and uh, wow, he, the, the famous chainsaw dance. And uh, Leatherface was certainly an interesting character, especially that scene uh, uh, after he's uh, put Terry on the meat hook, and he goes in there and he just kind of sits down there. It's like very conflicted. Uh, uh, Leatherface is, and and. Uh, Gunnar Hansen, of course, was very active at the uh, conventions as well. Talk about your experience working with Gunnar. Gunnar uh, and I remained friends over the years. Um, I'm trying to think the first time I met Gunnar um, it was probably in the makeup trailer. I don't know, though, because he shot a lot of stuff. But anyway, I took we, I took a liking to him right away. He and I hit it off just terrifically immediately, and we stayed that way over the, over the years, you know, quite close. I was closer to he and Marilyn were the two I was uh, I remained closest to over the years, probably. Oh yeah. And then Ed Neal. Ed Neal playing Ed the kind of our <laughs> archivist and our historian. Yeah, Ed, Ed, Edwin Neal playing the hitchhiker again. Uh, I think he was probably the craziest one of the the villains. Oh yeah. Uh, oh shit, yeah. Yeah, I I I I'd love love to get him on here too. If uh, I get, you should, I'd love to get him on here. But I I, I gotta say he was great, and of course uh, <laughs> the the I won't give away the ending for anybody who who hasn't seen it. But I gotta tell you, he he gets floored, so to speak. <laughs> Talk about yeah. working with him. He's a it was a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a really unique character. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no explaining him. Are you going to come to Calgary this year? Who me? Yeah, you I do? won't be this year. I I plan I plan to go to. We're all going to be there. You can talk to Ed. <laughs> oh. I, I, we got one into our, like, I, I live in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and where my, what, with my job situation, um, I can only get away, uh, for, for, uh, a certain time this year. I'm going to be at Horrorama, uh, when they do that, and that will be in Toronto. So, I, I don't. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> oh, gee, that's. We'll too, be there. Huh? I don't think I'll be there, but uh, I don't know if Ed's going to be there. I don't know. I gotta, I, I, I gotta talk to Chris Alexander about that and see what's going on with that because I went the last two years to Horrorama, and I had a what blast. Is that? It's a, it's a, a horror film convention in Toronto, and uh, I was. In, a, yeah, what when is it? It's usually either well, the the two years I went, it was in November. But I know there's been a couple of years. It's been in uh, October as well. The first one was in 2014, and uh, that had Tom Savini present in it. And uh, but I went in 2017 and 18. I was invited by one of my interview guests, and it was the first time I've been outside New Brunswick. So, uh, so I, I got Ever? to. A, yeah, I like I lived here all my life. Oh my God! You're... <laughs> yeah. Rather provincial, right? Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, a big world out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I had Lisa Langwa from class of nineteen eighty four on my show a couple of times and she asked me what was stopping me and 
She invited me to be her assistant at Horrorama, and I just had such a blast. And I've remained good friends with her. And uh, I went the last couple of years to Horrorama, and uh, it was very intimate. It was very uh, I, I I got a lot of guests for my show at these, you know, and it was just awesome, you know. So, but. Uh, yeah, I'd love it if they did something with Texas Chainsaw there. I think it'd be great. Yeah. I yeah. can't believe that we're not getting more, uh, you know, because I put out the word to everybody that, you know, it's our 45th reunion. I can't believe we didn't get more bites on it. Dan Doherty in uh, Calgary hit on it right away. You know, he said, yeah, let's do it. But well, everybody else has been, like, pulling teeth to get uh, personal appearances this year. I still don't understand why, but. Uh, you got big names that will come into the convention business who are taking up all the money and everything, too, you know. Yeah. So. Well, if you want me to, I could put, if, if, if you huh? want me to, I could put you in touch with Chris Alexander. Uh, no, I can't do that show anyway because I'm doing the Niagara at the end of October. Oh, okay. okay. So it's too close, both in time and in, in geography. Oh, Okay. All right. But thanks, anyhow. You sure? Well, I wouldn't have minded meeting you. Unfortunately, I, I won't be in Calgary for that, but I, it sounds like a blast, though. Calgary's hey. a great gear. You should, you should do that next year. Have you, uh, have you ever been here to New Brunswick before? No. Huh? No? Yeah, well, I'm <laughs> one hour ahead of Toronto and New York, so a lot of people don't know that, but... <laughs> But I'm two hours. Wow! Ahead. Oh, you're oh you're up by uh, in Nova Scotia. Yep, that's right. I'm two hours ahead of you, so. Yeah. Whoa. Mm-hmm. I had a friend who rode a motorcycle from Chicago to Nova Scotia one summer and back. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick Sullivan, he and two friends. He didn't pick up Edwin Neal, did he? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you Edwin Neal does not have any luck hitchhiking anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think anybody picked him up. Oh, boy. <laughs> he doesn't look quite the same. He's got a big, long, gray beard. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've seen convention pics of him. I, I, I heard he's a really nice guy, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, he is. We're all really nice people. Mm -hmm. Well, what were your memories of Jim Sido, you know, because. Uh... Jim Sido was a professional, 100%. Hundred mm percent. -hmm. He, uh, you know, when I said action, he was on. When I said cut, he sat down and went over his script. Quiet I, and studious. I I heard that um, when he worked with Marilyn Burns, he felt so bad when uh, he was supposed to hit her with the broom because he kept asking her after the takes, you know, were you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I know. He, yeah. But you know what? He sure delighted in it while he was doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But no, I, I've heard very nice things of, about him too. And then the film comes out, becomes a, a, a sleeper hit, but major controversial, you know? I mean, it would come out two years after Last House on the Left, which is also a controversial film, but I think uh, Texas Chainsaw hit a, uh, a bigger niche than Last House on the Left, and um, do, you, do you, what were your memories of the controversy of this film? Because I heard it was banned in like over twenty five states. Well, I thought they were being rather ridiculous, <laughs> but um, uh, if anything, it, it, you know, there's no such thing as bad press. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. just makes people want to see it more. You know, so the controversy probably helped us. Um, you know, and and, and uh, Roger Ebert gave us a great review, which is nice. Which uh, about a year after his review came out, I was in O'Rourke's, which is an Irish pub, in just outside the old town of Chicago back then. Mm -hmm. And he liked to drink in there. Roger did, and in his uh, film class, he sometimes he'd take him there or drinks and just hold his class in, in the pub, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in there, and um, New Year's Day, it was New Year's Day, and there was a private party going on in there, and I was with this gang from my neighborhood, and uh, we just walked in, even though we weren't invited, nobody said anything to us, <laughs> <laughs> and we were drinking for free, and I was standing next to Roger Ebert, 
And, uh, you know, there was a break in his conversation with whoever he was talking to. I said, Roger Ebert. And he said, yes. And I said, I want to thank you for comparing me to Dustin Hoffman uh, in your uh, newspaper column. He said, I didn't realize I'd done that. I said, yeah, I'm John Dugan from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He <laughs> said, oh, my God. <laughs> Hello, John. And we uh, became, you know, we would, Chicago for a large city is a small town. You know, it's a town of neighborhoods. And uh, I ran into Roger quite often over the years, and he'd always call me Dugan. Hey, Dugan. Hey, Ebert. <laughs> How's it going? He wanted to know how it was going with me. So um, that's my Roger Ebert story. But well, I'd say Ebert loved it. And he compared me to Dustin Hoffman, a little big man, in his review. <laughs> of what was it, Sam Stone or whatever the character was? That... I'm going to switch ears here. Sure. <laughs> hey. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, Ebert. Ebert, yep. I don't know if you ever saw a little big man, but... Uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman played the last surviving, uh, last survivor from the uh, Battle of the Little Bighorn, Custer's Last Stand. Okay. She was an infant at the time, and he played a hundred and something year old man, mm-hmm. and the makeup was very reminiscent of that makeup. So, uh, so in a way, I got con- compared to um, to Dustin Hoffman <laughs> <laughs> by Roger Ebert. You know, looking at your Internet Movie Database page, I mean, you did Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and there's a, like a uh, uh, 20-year gap uh, before you do Texas Chainsaw the Next Generation. Uh, uh, what was you doing mm-hmm. between the, in that gap? I just had to take a handful of pills. Sorry. <laughs> I'm still recovering from cancer. Um, uh, sorry to hear that. Well, I'm alive. <laughs> yeah. That's a good thing. Still here. Yeah. Um, do you have any trouble understanding me? Cause it's I, I understand. <laughs> I understand you fine. I understand you fine. Yep. They took half my jaw out, and then they took half my leg out and put it where my jaw is supposed to be. So. Oh. Um, so as far as uh, when the film first came out, uh, we got no respect in the industry. You know. Mm-hmm. And I took the opportunity, and the year after it came out, I moved to L.A. And to try to uh, you know, do some film work, because my brother-in-law and Toby were both on contract at um, Universal Studios. And I thought maybe, you know, it'd give me a leg up. But yep. Toby was not real keen on doing, there was really no love loss between the cast of Texas Chains on Massacre and Toby Hooper. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm sorry he's dead, but <laughs> um, well, but he, when I started auditioning, yeah. you know, going on interviews in L.A., <laughs> go out to a studio and see a casting director, mm-hmm. they'd see Texas Chainsaw Massacre on your resume, and they'd, they'd kind of chuckle and roll their eyes, you know, mm-hmm. because we had not yet become a uh, uh, iconic uh you know, cult, uh, cult classic, you know, mm-hmm. we were kind of like a joke to those people until the fucking dollars started rolling in. Oh yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. And then, <laughs> but it never did me any good. And so much, much later in life, with independent filmmakers who just want grandpa in their movie, you know? Well, Marilyn Burns had done uh, at least another film with uh, Toby Hooper, so. <laughs> so uh, well, Marilyn did, yes, but yeah. they were uh, romantically involved. Romantically when involved? They first, when they he put her through that. Uh, when they first moved to Los Angeles, uh, she moved. they lived together when I, when I first moved to L.A. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the, the the gap between Texas Chainsaw Massacre and New Generation, uh, I, I, what I'd asked before is, um, like, uh, what was going on with you in the industry uh, between then? Were you just not working in Nothing. Film? I didn't do anything for a long time. Okay. Um, 
because I got married and I had a, uh, had a child, mm-hmm. and uh, I was just concentrating on making money and raising a child, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, so I was just working a, you know, a regular job. Okay. You know, ten and bar, waiting tables, mm-hmm. mostly, that sort of thing. Other odd jobs, plumber's assistant, mm-hmm. haul freight, you know, whatever actors do for money. <laughs> Well, I know a lot of them that work regular jobs in between, so uh, you're not alone there. I think a lot of this glitter. So I really, you know, I really just started acting in the gym that long, you know, oh, just a few years ago. Well, Texas Chainsaw uh, New Generation. I mean, that that uh, brought us Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey, both now yeah. Academy Award winners. <laughs> <Talk> <laughs> yeah, about, isn't that wild? It, it is kind of wild now when you look at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have quite a few Academy Award winners amongst our uh, alumni. You got uh, Ron Bozeman, who was our production manager, uh, mm-hmm. went on to produce uh, Silence of the Lambs. Oh, yes. Won the Academy Award for that. Yeah. Um, Viggo Mortensen. Oh, and, yes. What, the third one? Yep. Yeah, he was just um, up from Green Book, yeah. And, of course, Dennis Hopper and, was in the uh, second one. <laughs> Who? Dennis Hopper was in the second one. Oh, yeah, Dennis Hopper. <laughs> he was already famous way before that. Yep. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else, anyone else who's gone on. But, that, you know, we have quite a legacy there. Mm-hmm. You got um, any memories of uh, Renee and uh, McConaughey on I, that? I, I didn't meet McConaughey, but I spent the entire day with Renee. If you've ever seen the film, that's the only scene I have is with Renee. And she was just a sweet little thing. <laughs> She wasn't Renee Zellweger yet. I mean, that was her name, but, you know, she was right out of theater school at University of Texas. I think she was 22 years old. Yeah, this is before she became Bridget Jones and wrote diaries. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yep. she was very, very nice, very professional. Mm-hmm. And I it... did post a picture on her Facebook account of the two of us together. Okay. A few years ago, and she had got no response back from it. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it was a production still. Um, yeah, whoever runs her Facebook account, I think, took it down. Too. <laughs> oh, well. Well, you know, you, and you did Texas Chainsaw 3D, which had the absolutely gorgeous uh, uh, Alexandria Daddario. And I, and I, got, I got to say, she got put through My the... My goodness. Yeah, oh, I think she is gorgeous. and. Uh, oh, she is. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, she, uh One morning, we were getting the, the uh, cast band to go out to them, to the... Um, Location, mm-hmm. as we shot outside of uh, Shreveport, mm-hmm. at, at a uh, decommissioned army base. Uh, she was. We were waiting for her. She was running late. Yeah. <laughs> All was packed into a thirteen passenger van, and everybody's kind of bitching and moaning about it. And she jumps in, her hair is still wet. You can smell the shampoo on it from her shower. And she looks at all of us and goes, I'm so sorry. And goes, oh, it's okay, honey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but she looked right at me with those eyes. I was sat down next to me. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those eyes, all right. She's got beautiful eyes. She is one gorgeous woman. I remember the first time I saw her was in a movie, Hall Pass, and with uh, Owen Wilson. And uh, she played this babysitter, and I remember seeing this in the theater, and she said a line about babysitting his kids and saying, they're like little monkeys that like want to climb all over me. And people, the males in the audience just snickered, and I'm like, yeah, I know what they're thinking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I never forgot her, and obviously, how could you? And of course, she had an intense scene that reminded me of Marilyn Burns in the original Texas Chainsaw, where she's strung up, and uh, they get her tape, her mouth all taped up there, and th- th- that chainsaw blade just inches away from her shoulder until one little mark just kind of saves her, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's got a lot of uh, criticism, but I, I like the film. Well, 
Uh, I I went to a bit the moment I found out she was in it. I knew there was going to be some nice scenery with Alexandra. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of nice scenery, I noticed on your cra- I didn't see this film, but you did Butcher Boys. I've interviewed uh, uh, Tori Terranova from that film. I didn't really know any of the younger actors on it. Mm-hmm. I had one scene. They did a cameo with um, uh, with Ed Neal. I play a convenience store owner, and he's a, 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 a homeless guy. Comes in and buys a <laughs> cup of coffee. <laughs> he plays a homeless guy. Somehow I can yeah. see him doing that. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh... One movie I got to talk to you about, and I noticed when I was ta- uh, going back and forth with you the other night, I mentioned Bite School, and you put, ha, 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 ha. Oh, yeah. Bite School. <laughs> yeah, he can bite me. <laughs> that guy. No, just kind of thing. Brian Stewart, who's an artist and a friend of mine, I, mean, I was at Atlanta at a convention. He comes over and says, can you do me a favor? I got a friend over here doing this old movie. You just come in and do this one little scene with me where you have to tell me. And I did it because I get to, you know, because of Brian. Mm-hmm. You know, I never even saw anything of it. Okay. And, uh, and I was to find out this guy's selling these fucking movies, making money on it. <laughs> yeah, I never signed a fucking release or anything that I remember. And, uh, and people would ask me about Bite School. I even know what it was. I, I never did a film called Bite School. <laughs> And people say, well, it's on your IMDb. It's a bite school. <laughs> and then when I found out what it was, yeah. And then he had the fucking nerve. I was in Texas mm-hmm. two years ago in Bastrop at a cast reunion. He was there. He had uh, somebody come over and ask me if I'd uh, be in a film that he was doing, you know, shoot a scene for him. For, for free on that day. He was afraid to ask me himself. Oh, okay. I said, no. No, I don't work for free. <laughs> well, so this is my yeah. thing on Bite School. Well, I, I, I interviewed James Belsamo, the director, uh, a yeah. couple of years ago. Um, and I come to know him because I'd interviewed an actress he'd had in a lot of his films. And, and I know she was in a lot of his films. And, uh, I remember, uh, like, I work nights, so I, I remember I was having my lunch one night, and I had this email, or uh, it looks like it was on Facebook Messenger from James Belsamo asking me if I would shoot my own death scene on, on my phone. And I just, I was kind of floored and flattered because I'd seen all the people that cameoed in his movies, and I was like, really me it's like a step down asking me but i was flattered so i called him because i knew he'd still be up and i i asked him i said what's the context of my death scene and you know he said to keep it under uh, two minutes and whatnot so i got my brother to shoot a a scene uh, a small death scene of me uh very simple to do for cool as hell too and has Linnea Quigley in it, who I met at Horrorama last year. So I was like, uh, it gave me an idea of what to do. So uh, I shot it. Um, you know, I, I I never thought anything of it. I was just flattered, you know. But uh, uh huh. Yep. I haven't seen Bite School, so I'm sorry you had that experience. But but even with this, no, it's just a weasel of free performance out of me. I don't, you know. Yeah. And uh, uh, what does Linnea got paid? Did you see your movie? The one you did? Um, I've ordered it now. I didn't get paid for it, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, but I wonder if Linnea is uh, just a little bitty part. I wonder if he did the same thing to her did to me, you know. Hey, she shoot this whole scene? <laughs> and then puts her name on the cover of it, you know. Yeah, um, I don't know. That's I've had crazy. good interactions with uh, James Belsamo, but... No, uh, I, and I didn't ask for money to be in uh, Cool as Hell too. I, I, I did ask him about it, but at the same token, I was flattered, you know, like uh, considering, oh, right. yeah, course. I was like, look at the people he's had in his films, and I'm like, 
but he told me he enjoyed doing my show. He enjoys my interviews. So I felt very complimented. So I said, sure. So I got the, shot a little scene and sent it to him. And uh, that, that was that. I, the only thing I asked him, I said, uh, in return, I said, uh, take part in a charity challenge that I do for uh, suicide and depression and nominate people in the industry. And he said he'd be fine with that. And I said, sure, that, that'll, that'll break us even fine. So that's, that's what oh, I did. Good. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, bite, bite school, you know, uh, Ron Jeremy in that. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I can say I'm in a film with Ron Jeremy. <laughs> You're, yeah. Uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis. Well, I'm sorry you had that experience. I had no idea, you know. It was not a bad. It was just when I found out what had happened, I felt like I'd been, uh, you know, somebody pulled one over on me. I didn't appreciate it. So anyway, Chainsaw 3D. Mm-hmm. Getting back to that one. I got the call on that. Kim Hankel called me. Mm-hmm. I was living in Louisville, Kentucky. Kim called me and said they were doing yet another Texas Chainsaw Massacre in the the uh, producer wanted to know wanted to know my contact information. Could he give it out? And I said, sure. You know. So about a day later, <clears throat> um, Carl Massacone from Lionsgate calls me mm-hmm. and uh, said they were doing a, uh, another installment of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and they'd be honored if I reprised my role as Grandpa. What did I think? I said. Uh, I said, are you kidding? I said, I've been waiting for 30 fucking years for this phone call. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I walked to Texas to do it. So, um... <laughs> Plus, you get to work with Alexandria, and that's kind of an added bonus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah wow. Well, it was nice because uh, they scheduled us. Uh, Marilyn and Gunnar and I all had a, a Wednesday off. Mm-hmm. And we all went to lunch together. Without they went to lunch because I wasn't answering the phone apparently because <laughs> I had worked all night the night before, a long, long day the day before, mm-hmm. and uh, I had really overslept. And uh, so I met them as they were finishing lunch, and then uh, we had drinks at that place and moved to another place so that that place could set up for dinner and just. Uh, Talked and talked and talked. Marilyn and Gunnar and I, we had so much fun. Oh, yeah. Reminisces. Yeah. You, you, you guys didn't torture poor Marilyn, did you? <laughs> no. no, no. <laughs> oh, she was such a sweetheart. Oh, yeah. I, I wish I could. Such a shock when she died. Yeah. Um, uh, going back to Bite School, you got a film that's filming right now. Remember I told you that... Um, I, I come to contact James Balsamo through an actress. The actress in question was uh, Gino Viva Rossi, and I guess she's got you in Attack of the Killer yeah, Chickens. Yeah, I did a bit for her. Yeah. For free, but that's because I like her. <laughs> I I did not realize until I was looking at your credits that. Yeah, I'm in Killer Chickens from Outer Space or whatever it's called. And 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 uh, she's directing it. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I mean, she's a trip. Yeah. Yeah, I'm still in touch with her, too. And uh, that was how I come to contact James, because she was in a lot of James's movies. And, uh, yeah, Attack of the Killer Chickens. Now, uh, right in vain of Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. you got Attack of the Killer Chickens. Uh, what can you tell me about this movie? And in particular, what's she like uh, as uh, an actress slash director because now she's on two parts. Oh, I did one little scene with her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really uh one for her. I just it was a talking head. I did I played the uh I think I'm the president or something. Okay. That's the news. Mm-hmm. You know breaking into uh you know breaking news. Now the president, you know, and I, I'm telling everybody to be careful because these chickens and I end up getting killed by a chicken on camera. <laughs> yeah. <It> was dumb. <laughs> yeah, but I I love the innovation behind films like this. You know, um, I might have to get her on again because I didn't realize she directed this until I was looking up stuff 
on you. You play Prime Minister Dugan. <laughs> is that what it is, Prime Minister? Okay. Prime Minister yeah. Dugan. <laughs> but but yeah yeah she she seems like a trip. Oh yeah, she's great. Now I I also know that you've worked with uh, Ari Lee Min in a couple of movies too. Of course, he was in. Uh, uh, played Jason in the original Friday the 13th. Mm-hmm. Yep. He and I are both at Rock, Paper, Dead. Yeah, I had uh, Victor Miller on, uh, who's a screenwriter of the original Friday the 13th, right. and he talked about this. Victor's a great guy. Wonderful guy. Yep. Uh, what can he you tell me? The, he gave me the part of a lifetime, man. Yeah? Rock, Paper, Dead. Yeah, Uncle Charles. Man. And I guess and there's he a... stood up for me, you know? When they were getting rid of, or trying to get rid of everybody who Victor Wilde in this film, mm-hmm. he stood up for me and for Ari. Oh, that's beautiful. It's just about both of us, uh, uh, both of us still being in the cast. So, why did they want you guys gone? They want to pay for transportation. Oh, to L.A. Okay. Transportation and hotel. Okay. I guess there's some of bitches. Yeah. Well, apparently you got a uh, pre-production on a sequel to it. Dead Betrayal paper. I uh, certainly sure hope so. Yep. Well, it says paper uh, rock centers be- because uh, you know Tom uh, Tom Holland directed it. Oh yeah, he directed my favorite vampire film, Fright Night. Oh yeah, he, yeah. He wrote that too. Mm-hmm. Okay. But um. Yeah, he would be to town on this thing. After our first setup, um, and we were changing, the, they were readjusting the lights or something. And he called me over, and uh, first thing I said was, John, where have you been for? <laughs> where have you been for the last forty years?" <laughs> Which is a good sign, I think. <laughs> and uh, it was one of the things he said to me. But then after. Uh, uh, Another shot or something. He called me over and said, John, are you worried about overacting this part? And I said, well, yeah, I think it'd be easy to overact it. He said, don't. Don't worry about that. Said, you are playing a psychopath in the memory of a psychopath. Because my part's all in flashback. Okay. Uh, the flashback. I play the uncle of the serial killer. The insane uncle of the serial killer. Pedophile. And um, so he just cut me loose, you know, gave me free reign, let me run. And it was so much fun. Yeah, it was rather disturbing. <laughs> but um, you know, I had to go to some pretty dark places there. Mm-hmm. But, boy, it's, it's, I can't wait until that film is released. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to get work out of it. I think I'll get work out of it for sure. So, you know, it's been two fucking years trying to get distribution on it. Yeah, well, yeah, it's getting harder. And I, these are usually the kind of movies that, that I'd be into because uh, I usually like the more indie movies that's uh, got people like yourself in them because it's nostalgic, and I like that. You got a, a movie coming out called Book of Ash. I don't know how much you could talk about, but... Uh, look- no, I can't really because it never came to fruition. Oh, because Lynn... I find a uh, letter of intent to do that film maybe five years ago, six years ago or something. I never heard anything back from him. Yeah, it's got Lynn Lowry listed for that. I met her at Horrorama last year. What a lovely angel. It has who? Lynn Lowry. Yeah, Lynn Lowry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah she's terrific. I like her. Yeah, I, uh, she gives nice hugs. I know that. I remember my picture <laughs> take, taken with her. Oh no! <laughs> no, that that she, she does that. Her PJ Souls does that too. But I never met PJ yet. But uh, PJ I, Souls, uh, um, who's the one that kisses right on the mouth from um, uh, 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 oh, I'll be back. You know what? Uh, oh, Schwarzenegger. Oh, Linda Hamilton. Yeah, Linda Hamilton. <laughs> kiss you right on the mouth, big wet kiss. Oh, nice. Your yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Lynn Lowry. <laughs> I uh, I uh, had a good experience meeting her, and uh, 
and eventually I'm going to have her on. So uh, I know she's agreed to it, but she's doing a book right now, so she can't come on right now. But but uh, she is interested. I I really enjoyed meeting her, and yeah, Book of Ashes. Yeah, she's a good friend of mine. She's a close friend of mine. Yeah, we had one year where we must have done about five or six shows together. You know, so we, you know we do dinner and drinks and that whole. Thing. Yeah. Oh, she still looks stunning too. Oh, absolutely. She's aged well. But uh You certainly have. Yep. I I, I, I got the uh the whole package for VIP package for Hororama, so I saw her both days and and uh had a nice chat with her. But um and then you did the hospital and the hospital too as well. Uh the hospital too is just archival footage. Okay. That's why I'm crediting both of them. That's the one film I just don't mention. <laughs> okay, that's that's all right. We we won't go into it. Um, <laughs> we we know you've uh, been ba- battling cancer, and and I, I, my parents are both suffering from illnesses, so I can totally understand. And uh, and I I hope that you get better, and I hope things look up for you. <clears throat> Do you want to talk about anything about that? Uh. I'd like to thank my oncologists, and that <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, was a rough. It was a weird year, man. You know, I uh, it was oral cancer, and I smoked cigarettes for forty-seven years. I quit five years ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> you should have stuck with and, sucking uh, on and, fingers. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, but I had known. I had known for about a year and a half that something was going on in my mouth. There was a sore spot back there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I waited. You won't understand this because you're Canadian. Mm-hmm. I waited until I turned 65 for the Medicare because I couldn't afford to go to a doctor and find out I had cancer. Oh. Ain't that a fucking. Yeah. Shit. Yeah. You know, so the fucking shitty-ass government of my country almost killed me. You know, really, really fucking chaff for ass. I'm hearing a lot of complaints about your government and your country. <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Yeah. It well, my daughter immigrated to Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, he's in the process of immigrating to Australia. And I said, and she was, you know, because it's so far away, Daddy. I said, don't worry. Live your life. Go, go, go. <laughs> the hell out of here you know yep oh yeah it's a i i won't even go to the states right now it's such a nightmare you know uh the conservatives uh you know i don't know you guys call them the tories or whatever conservatives in this country have ruined it just ruined it they got control and they just they went from being the sensible yet conservative party you know middle of the road sort of to just downright mean, nasty, lying, thieving, sacks of shit. Yep. Every single one of them. I'm not pulling any punches on this. <laughs> Do people hear this in the United States? <laughs> <clears throat> they can, but you know what? I've heard people say even darker things than you about the whole thing, so uh, you're you're fine. I agree with you. You know, it almost could, could have killed me. Mm-hmm. You know, if I didn't turn 65 till this year, well, you know, I probably you know, probably would have. Because it had gotten into my jaw by then, by the time it was diagnosed. So I got Medicaid in March. And uh, by the time I could get an appointment to see uh, a specialist, you know, get referred, it was... Uh, May, mm-hmm. and I was diagnosed in May, and the quickest I could get surgery was the end of July. I did it as quickly as I possibly could. Mm-hmm. And then I did six weeks of radiation and six weeks of chemo. And that ended three months ago. And I'm in recovery from that now. 
I'm having one of those days today. I'm still in bed, man. <laughs> oh, oh, well, well, I hope this has been relaxing for you. But I, I, I do have <laughs> a couple. Just got me up. I just whipped off the covers and stood up while I was talking about the Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I, 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 I wanted to ask, too, speaking of the uh, cancer, do you, do you have any charities that you're involved in or, or support that you want to plug on here? Charities I support besides the American Cancer Society now. Yep. I guess um uh the Special Olympics has always been my charity. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, that's a great charity. You get a, web, a wonderful charity. You get a web page. Have you ever been to an event? Ever been to a special Olympics event? No. I haven't, no. No. It's really something. Mm hmm. I've worked a couple of them. Oh fantastic. So yeah. You you have a web page that you want to plug on here? No. Nah. No. Okay. Nope. Well, here's a. Uh, I have a Facebook page. You have a Facebook page. You, it, yeah. You mind if I add you on Facebook? No, go right ahead. Okay, I'll do that. I got Terry, so Terry, Terry's not frightened of me. So. <laughs> Um, here's a question I ask uh, a lot of people, especially people that done a lot of horror films. Uh, when you go to the conventions, I'm, I got, by the way, I love the horror film fans. You know, uh, I, I've met at Horrorama, just what wonderful uh, acceptance I felt there. And uh, but, what's the most unique thing you've ever been asked to sign? I signed a woman's breast. <laughs> <laughs> and the weird thing is, uh, you know, I said, she wanted me to sign her breast. So I said, well, okay. I said, but only if you'll let me sign it right on your areola. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, okay. <laughs> so this guy, we were in a, a little downstairs club in uh, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And um, there was another guy at the bar. He said, well, I'll stand here so nobody can see what you're doing. And he kind of blocked the rest of the room to see what was going on. And she took her breast out. And I got a Sharpie, and I started signing the areola around her nipple. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it all puckered up. You know, she got it, it, she got aroused or something. I don't know. It was cold or whatever. <laughs> it puckered up. It got all bumpy, and then I couldn't sign it. And then... And so the guy who was helping me said, she said, just go scribble something. She's not going to know tomorrow morning what the hell it is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is funny. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. I've heard stories about people. Um, I don't know what it was, Caroline Monroe that told me this, but but I've heard it from a few few guests that say that they see they'd sign body parts and then they'd see them later having it tattooed. The Tattoo. name to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of uh, there are several conventions around. There are always tattoo artists at uh, horror conventions now for some reason. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of hardcore you, you don't see many hardcore horror fans that don't have at least one tattoo. <clears throat> Well, I'm a hardcore horror, horror fan, but I have no tattoos. I've never had a desire to get a tattoo. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they really do seem to go hand in hand. Yeah. So. Uh, well, I know they were at Horrorama, so I, they were definitely there when I was walking around the vendors. But what's the most fun convention you've done? You got one in particular that you like best? Hmm. I like Central Wasteland in in, uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, okay. a lot. Okay. Great show. Okay. And I like the um, Days of the Dead in uh, – it's a toss-up between Indianapolis and Atlanta. Okay. I guess I like the Atlanta one because it's right downtown in Atlanta, and you can walk out. And you're, you're in downtown Atlanta instead of out by the airport or something. Okay. Because a lot of these uh, conventions, you're staying out by the airport for the whole weekend. Oh, so you never get to see the city, you know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you know what? We're celebrating 45 years of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and uh, uh, I'm going to tell you, it's, it's I, I can't believe, you know, I would have been two years old when that came out. I didn't see it at two years old, mind you. It would have <laughs> we given me nightmares, but uh, uh, I've got it home on Blu-ray, and uh, I'm hoping that... Uh, you and Edwin and and uh, Terry will be able to make it out to a convention near me at some point. I hope so. Yeah, I think that would be great. But but uh, yeah, forty five years, <clears throat> and of course we wish you a very speedy recovery. Uh, I'm really sorry Thank you're you. going. Yeah, I'm sorry you're going through that. Like. I get it because my my father's got ALS and my mom's got Parkinson's and so I, I oh boy yeah so I really get it when you say you you were battling cancer I, I totally I totally get it there's just a I I wish there was a cure for that that stuff and it's just hard to watch <laughs> yeah yeah well thanks for talking to me I appreciate it yes I I was honored to have you on I just wondering if before uh, I let you go if you would do a plug for my show. Oh, uh, what's it called? Um, Python's Paradise. Python like the snake. Like this is John Dugan, and you're listening to Python's Paradise. That sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. Python's Paradise or Python Paradise? Python's. With a no S. Okay. Apostrophe S, yep. Yeah. Uh, count me down. Okay. Three, two, one, go. Hey, this is John Dugan, Grandpa from Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and you're listening to Python Paradise. <laughs> Thank you so much, John, for allowing me the honor, and uh, uh, we'll be we'll be in touch. <laughs> no problem. And, oh, I I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. So uh, well, thank you, man, and hello and my love to all my Canadian fans. I love you. Absolutely. Well, we love you, too. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. You take care. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bye.